welcome everybody to this new coffee talk. For those who are for the first time, I want you to let you know that Transmedia History Telling is a project from the Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory here in Frankfurt and belongs to the Department of Historical Regimes of Normativity. We are having some difficulties with the network. I hope this is going to be solved uh, soon. Um, but well, the aim of this virtual space is to talk with colleagues that are successfully using different media to communicate their historical knowledge. Um, and these conversations are really essential for the Transmedia History Telling Project, since we are also trying to create uh, new types of historical narratives for legal history. So if you don't know the project, please check some of the work we have developed in our social media accounts or in the page of, of uh, the, uh, the Institute. Today we have an extraordinary guest. We are here with Richard Cunningham. Uh, Richard is the author of the graphic novel titled Old Rise, Resistance and Rebellion in South Africa, 1910-1948. And we are going to talk with him today about his work. So Richard, welcome to Transmedia History Telling Live and thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Thank you very much for having me, Carla. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing how your professional life uh, and trajectory led you to the creation of this wonderful work. Uh, why don't you tell us more about this, this process? Sure. Um, first of all, hello to everyone who's watching around the world. Um, I am in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, where I live with my, with my wife. Um, and, but I'm South African, uh, hence the subject matter of my book, All Rise. Um, thanks for the introduction, uh, Carla. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, I am a, a writer professionally. Um, I actually didn't study history. I studied literature um, at university. And um, after university, I became involved with some civil, civil society organizations and activist groups in uh, Cape Town, South Africa where I worked for on and off for about 10 years. And along the way, I was um, exposed to a lot of the um, injustices that South Africans, working class South Africans are um, suffering, uh, even in the, the current democratic era. And a lot of the um, civil society activist campaigns surrounding those injustices. And um, I began to work uh, to use my, my writing skills to try and try and uh, play a role in those campaigns. And the first um, book that I produced um, was called Safety, Justice and People's Power. And it was related to um, a commission of inquiry into policing in a place called Kailicha, which is um, one of the largest townships. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the word township, it's sort of like a favela in Latin America, an informal settlement in other parts of the world. Um, in uh, just outside of Cape Town uh, in, in the Western Cape in South Africa. And um, it was really a companion. The book was a companion to um, a very dense um, tome of a report that was produced, uh, brilliantly produced by uh, the commissioners of the inquiry. But it struck me as very inaccessible to the very people who most needed to understand the findings of the commission. So I started to think about ways in which to sort of to crack open that complex knowledge and make it accessible to everyday people, maybe people who were second language English speakers or third language English speakers. And um, around that time, um, I came across the work of two brothers um, who were producing cheap comic books about working class life in particular communities around Cape Town. I, I, I met them uh, and uh, convinced them to work with me. And as a result, this companion to the, the Kailicha Commission is a sort of mixed media book of, uh, of text, uh, photographs, and the Trantral brothers, these brothers' uh, illustration work, uh, including some comics. Um, and uh, it really struck me uh, once we published the book and we distributed it uh, within um, the Kailicha community how when, when young people were paging through the book, 
they, they didn't spend much time looking at the words that I'd written. They spent all of their time engaged with the illustrations, even more than the photographs. And that's when I started to appreciate the power of illustration as an artistic medium. And also started to think about the stigma, particularly from the academic community, towards the medium of comics and graphic novels and graphic histories. And uh, I decided that I wanted to do more work in this area. And that then led me to the stories in All Rise. Sorry, Carla, I don't want to speak too much. And I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be sort of, you know, answering later questions. But, but, uh, but basically, in short, um, All Rise is a collection of legal stories based on court records from the first half of the 20th century in South Africa. These stories have never been told before, partly because the legal records on which they, on which they are based are neglected. They sit, uh, the copies sit inside, um, I'm just going to share, if I can, the, the image. They sit inside a court uh, basement archive in the city of Bloemfontein, um, right, in the, right in the heart of South Africa. Um, they're not catalogued, so if you want to um, look through them, you have to just manually take out the boxes in this illustration and uh, see what's inside each one. And I was specifically looking for resistance court cases because I thought that they would tell us something about the time, which maybe other court cases wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, the result was, we, we uh, well, I found um, six uh, very strong stories from the first half of the 20th century. And I decided to work with um, not just the Trantral brothers, but um, the best illustrators I could find um, across South Africa to, to, to create a graphic history collection reviving these stories. Well, I, I would like to know more about these, these court cases. I, 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 each chapter of the comic book is structured with, with one case, but I was wondering or I understood that you check more cases. And I, I would like to, to know more, how, how many they were, how was the criteria of selection of these specific stories, uh, how long the, 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 this process of research uh, uh, um, took? Sure. Sure. Okay. So I think, I think to answer that question, let me first just say a little bit more about the court itself. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, was, it was created in 1910 uh, okay. when the British and Dutch, the two major colonial forces in South Africa, decided to join in, in governing the country as a union. Previously, they'd been fighting over territory, and in 1910, they decided to do it together for the first time. And uh, one of the reasons why today in South Africa, we have three capital cities. We have the executive capital in, in Pretoria, Chwane. We have the uh, judicial capital in Bloemfontein, in the middle of the country, and we have the legislative capital in Cape Town. That's because the two different sides were trying to work out some kind of balance between their, their, their areas of, of, of strength. And Bloemfontein ended up like the halfway house between British Cape Town and, and Dutch uh, Pretoria, as it was then. Um, this was the highest court in the land, the appellate division, it was called. The, very, the, 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 law, the, sort of, the, the place where, where, where cases were ultimately decided if they, if they were unresolved in the lower courts. Today, we have the Constitutional Court, which was a democratic uh, era development. It's higher than, than the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, as the appellate division is now co called. But this Bloemfontein court continues to operate. And so from 1910 and to today, court, uh, cases are heard there. And uh, once they've been decided, the documents end up downstairs in this, in this old dusty archive. So, mm -hmm. so I, I went down and started looking from 1910 through to the present day. And to answer your question about... Um, how many cases I found. Remember, I was looking specifically for resistance cases. So there were, there were cases about everything down there from divorce to corporate disputes. Um, but I found now and then a resistance case, which involved uh, usually a working class person who was experiencing some form of discrimination or prejudice by the government or maybe a corporation taking on that opponent using the courts. Other times it was someone who had broken the law as a result of their frustration with this injustice, and then they'd end up in the court. So, they were, so, so that's, that's an important distinction. They were either seeking justice through the courts or they were, um, they, they were brought to the courts because they had committed a crime, essentially. Now, I, I, those, those cases continue to, to the present day, um, but I chose um, the six cases that fall into the first half of the 20th century because that's a neglected period in South Africa. Almost 
everyone in the world who knows something about South African history will know about apartheid. And that was from 1948 until the early 1990s. Um, I was more interested in, in, in this lesser known period that led to apartheid. But um, I also did find court cases from the apartheid era. And there are also resistance cases from the current democratic era. So it's, so it's absolutely possible for other volumes of this, of this book to be created in the future. No, that, that's great news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, when I was reading the the, the book, uh, I it really called my attention the sections called uh, "Behind the Story," um, because of course the, the the first thing you do as a reader is really engage with the story and the graphics and all the 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 um, series of resistance and rebellion but then uh, appeared the, the the explanation they uh, maybe you can show us some of the sections i'm talking about because i really liked like the three different um information that these sections uh, brought like first like some primary sources some first drafts of the of the um, of the drawings and uh, some pictures uh, I really would like to know how, why did you decide to include this kind of material? What is behind this, this, this section? Because I imagine there has a, also an um, educa educational purpose. Sure, great question. Um, so in the research process, obviously these are very obscure stories. These are not your standard uh, um, historical tales centered on heroes like Nelson Mandela or Steve Biko or uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, or the, 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 the villains of apartheid, for instance. These are about um, the everyday uh, working people who got caught up in resistance campaigns and then ended up in the courts. And therefore, we know who they were, or we at least know their names and some, some basic biographical information. If they hadn't been involved in those court cases, the, the authorities probably wouldn't have cared enough about them to, to, to ever record their lives. And of course, uh, most of them uh, just, just as a historical fact about working class people, we have, they, they didn't record their, their own history very much because they had other more important things to worry about. So, so we don't have much evidence of their lives. So I was, um, I started in this, this downstairs basement in Bloemfontein. And once I had the basic ingredients of the story based on the court records, I then went to other archives and, 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 uh, sought other, um, other, uh, other resources uh, and references around the country in libraries in the form of books and memoirs, sometimes paintings, to piece together the story in a reliable way. Every now and again, I came across an absolute gem of a, of a, of a historical source. Um, it could be a photograph, a letter, a spy report, something like that, which would help me piece together the story in a reliable way that was based on something. I wasn't just jumping to, to conclusions about what actually happened. Um, and those were just frankly too good not to include. I just, I mean, I, I'll just give you an example. So, so this is, this is um, a pa the opening page of the first story of the book, which Carla, as you know, it's, it's, it's about Indian passive resistors in Johannesburg um, shortly after the turn of the 20th century, sort of around 1910. At the bottom there, you see Gandhi speaking in front of a large gathering in what today is called Newtown in Johannesburg. Uh, Gandhi is one of those hero figures that we've got many books about, but he is not the protagonist of the story. He is a peripheral figure who happens to be on the first page. <clears throat> he features very little. And later on in the story, we have, um, see if I can, see if I can grab a page where we get, where we've got him. Um, I'm going to go right to the end. Okay. Uh, we have uh, the characters on the on the on the right hand side of this page. You can see a son hugging his father. Now th that was a th the father was a was a merchant uh, who had a uh, had a, a group of stores, um, a sort of a chain of stores in uh, Johannesburg and its surrounding towns around that time in 1910. And his son came over from India to join him, and the idea was for him to inherit this business. On the left. In the middle of the page there, you can see um, some men standing on a ship. Those were uh, street hawkers. They sold, um, so, well, they worked in different jobs. Some pulled rickshaws, some worked as chefs in, in simple restaurants. Others sold fruit and baskets on the street. They, they ended up um, participating in Gandhi's passive resistance campaign. 
Um, and and th those two halves of the page, the men on the ship, the father and son, they ended up in different court, court cases around similar issues of, of deporting Indians from the Johannesburg area, what was then uh, Transvaal. Um, and I was not expecting to find any photographs of, of those characters, just simply because they are the kind of people that history, unfortunately, forgot. But uh, sitting one day in the National Archives in um, uh, Pretoria, I found, that's, that's Gandhi, that wasn't difficult, but that, the document on the top right there, now that's a photograph of the boy in the story. And it's yeah. just too good to, not to include that. So, so I, for each story, I tried to sort of uh, add an extra layer of meaning um, at the end of the story, combined with the, uh, these, the preliminary sketches of the artists to try and show you know, a deeper level beneath the graphic stories. This is amazing. These, these documents are, are, are really wonderful. And as you know, I'm also working on a graphic story, uh, uh, history, and lately I've been thinking a lot about the role of imagination. I know in historical work, I know you know a historian, but you were constructing a historical narrative. And, and I really would like to know more how was your experience with this idea of imagination because you wanted to be reliable and you were trying to look for a lot of documents that, that were able to use in order to create this this graphic um, uh, world but at the same time you are using a lot of imagination in connecting the dots in creating the story in selecting some kind of sources and not others what was the role of imagination in in in, in that in that in that work uh, Greg, i mean this is the kind of question that i could speak forever about so i uh, i'll try to be as concise as possible but that is really at the heart of the creation process of this book because these are true stories. They did happen. Um, but uh, there, there is very little evidence of them left to us today. So the, the obvious dilemma is how does one revive, re, sort of recreate the story in the graphic form through a combination of, of illustrations and words in a way that is as closely representative of the, of the truth as possible? Obviously, it can be quite a suffocating thing, that, because if you, if you, if you are afraid of any imagination, you don't want to step away from the, the 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 sort of the basic facts you it's very difficult to, to pass go um because you can't uh you you need a little bit of freedom to, to to move and be flexible i coming from an academic background uh in the humanities where i learned how to research and and sort of build an argument based on sources i was actually quite a stickler for for evidence along the way i felt very uncomfortable um about jumping to, uh, to conclusions based on no evidence. So um, every single creative decision that the artists and I made in All Rise is based on something. Maybe it's not 100% based on uh, um, a, a conversation that happened, for instance, like a dialogue, like a dialogue between two characters, but, um, but it's, it is still based on something. And I'll give you some examples. So, so this, this page, which I'm sharing now, is... Just, is um, is from the uh, the third chapter of the book, um, which is about the Rand Revolt, uh, where white miners in the Vidvardhanaunt around Johannesburg uh, took up arms against the government and their employers in 1922. It was a very kind of spectacular instance of of um, rebellion uh, revolt in in South Africa in the in the early part of the 20th century. Very few people know about it, surprisingly, but. The government even bombed its own citizens. They took World War I planes um, that were just sitting idle um, a few years after the war, and they took them up into the skies and they bombed areas that the miners had taken over. Now, this, because it was about uh, white men, uh, and because it was against the government and very wealthy employers, it was extremely well chronicled. So I ha we had amazing photographs in, in the sources and sketches section after this chapter. We've got a lot of photographs. It was difficult to choose, actually, which ones to include. But th that's the one extreme. So it was actually very easy for us to base all of the visuals and all of the, um, uh, all of the text on, on things we knew, uh, with very rare exceptions. However, the very next chapter, chapter four, is about a black woman living in Pretoria uh, at a very similar time in the early 1920s 
Let me just quickly add an, add an image there. Okay, now, now, now because it was a black woman, because she was a woman, because she was black, um, living under a racist white government in the 1920s, um, it's not surprising that we have almost nothing to go on about this woman and her life and the events surrounding it. So um, all we had actually was 112 words uh, from a court transcript where she stood up and made a statement. Now, just to give a little bit of context here about the story, um, a black woman living in um, the Pretoria and Johannesburg and other urban areas in, uh, in, in that part of the country in the 1920s did not have to carry a pass, meaning they did not need permission to be in any particular areas uh, of the city at a particular time of day or night. Men, however, black men did have to carry those passes and it was very much put a part of their normal life. But suddenly in 1926, the government introduced um, a new resolution which, uh, which required black women for the first time in their lives to, to seek out a pass, go to an office, acquire this document if they wanted to go into certain areas where white people lived after 10 p.m. at night. This was obviously an outrage for them because it completely disrupted their, their, their routines and they decided that they had to act in some way. They could have acted by taking to the streets and protest in large numbers, but they decided to actually seek justice through the courts. In order to do that, in order to initiate that process, they needed um, someone to volunteer to go into the white area after 10. In other words, break the law, be arrested, and then a court case would ensue. This woman, her name was Helena de Tordi, uh, we know from her very short uh, transcript in court that she was a widow, that she worked as a washerwoman for money, and that she lived in the township of Marabastad, one of the earliest um, informal settlements in South Africa. And, um, and as a result, she, uh, of, she volunteered to go out at night. She got arrested and she ended up working through the courts from the lowest level up to the appellate division in Bloemfontein, where she miraculously won because of a legal technicality. Now, we know the details of the case, but how do we bring to life her social environment? So that was a major challenge because we didn't know anything. But fortunately, there's a memoir written by one of South Africa's greatest writers, Eskia Mpatlele, who, um, who by great fortune was growing up as a, as a little boy, uh, not even 10 years old, in the very same informal settlement at the very same time this happened. He later in life wrote a, a wonderful memoir, which I really recommend, called Down Second Avenue, in which he evokes the, um, the milieu of Marabasta during that, that time. He doesn't mention Helena because she was one of you know, thousands of people living in the informal settlement, but he mentions gossip in the queues for water for street taps in the mornings. He describes the interiors of, of, of the homes of the people living there, etc. And so we were able to piece together likely um, details of the kind of life she led. Um, and that's how we did it. So while it I'm certain it wasn't exactly the way Hilda's life was. At least it is based on something uh, that has been relayed to us uh, from the past through, through the eyes of someone who actually experienced it firsthand. So those, that's an example of the kind of creative decisions we made along the way. Yeah, and I have to confess that that was one of my favorite stories. Like, because I know it's really difficult to portray that about females and but also uh, a child. Uh, and, um, and another thing that I really liked was th that you included music in, in not only in the in that uh, uh, chapter but in, in other in other cases. And I remember my experience as a reader while while I was reading uh, when I I, I I saw these parts. I I was forced to imagine how that music could sound. Uh, what was the decision that included this kind of song? What is the role of music in this in this stories? Yeah, I mean, that's a great detail you, you're picking up there. I, I haven't been asked this question before. Um, it's, uh, I suppose it's sort of because of the way that um, early 20th century um, working class campaigns, uh, it, it was, song was, was a major part of, of motivating people and, and um, facilitating solidarity within movements. And that, I did not know that when I started researching this book, but it came out in the sources. So for instance, in um, 
sort of syndicalist or um, you know trade union uh, newspapers, they would sometimes include the fact that this song was sung at the, the march yesterday, right? And and that was a great detail that I had at my disposal because I because because I, I accepted that as fact that 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 the march where, where I know my protagonist was uh, during that march, the song was sung. So why not include that as part of the experience? of this revival of the march itself. So, I mean, th th I'm just trying to think back of the different instances where we do use song. Um, I, yeah, you're right. It sort of does appear in almost every, in every, every uh, chapter. Um, the one that comes to mind first is actually the last chapter. I'll see if I can try and get this page. Uh, they're very small on my screen, so it's quite tricky to select it accurately. But let's see. I think it is. Yeah, I'm going to be very close if I'm not exactly right. Uh, okay, almost. But basically, this is a story, the very last story of the book, where... Um, let me say two things about this, because it's related to song, but it's also related to your previous question about creativity. This is a story about migrant, uh, black migrant workers who were drawn out of the rural areas in the, in the middle of the 20, well, throughout the early 20th century, but this story takes place in the 1940s, around the time of the Second World War. And basically, white uh, corporate mine owners in, in cahoots with the government were trying to find ways to extract as much gold and minerals as possible at the lowest expense. And their strategy for doing that was to get black men who were otherwise in the rural areas to travel lo large distances to, to live in single sex uh, hostels and uh, dormitories with horrific conditions in the Johannesburg area and go to work, you know, at two o'clock in the morning or, or start in the middle of the day and, and work late until late at night. Um, and, endure huge risks to their to their health and to their lives by going deep into the earth and extracting gold. Now, this was a really important uh, part of South Africa's 20th century history that I wanted to include in this book, but I had a challenge. There was no court case in the, in, in the, uh, uh, the appellate division which spoke directly to the miners' experience. There were some high-level court, court cases that were normally brought to the, to, um, the judiciary by uh, maybe white uh, sympathizers or trade union workers or something like that. But I wanted to get to the lives of the, of the workers themselves. In order to do that, I had to make an exception. So we based the story on fragments of the, the little things we know about the earliest trade union um, uh, major demonstration and strike by black workers uh, in the 1940s. And um, the... In this, and so again, I, I had to go beyond the, the obvious sources to try and piece together the story reliably. And one of, the, um, one of the sources I found was a wonderful book about the songs that uh, workers that came from what is um, today is known as the country of Lesotho, which is landlocked inside um, South Africa, was then Basotho land. Um, the workers that came from there had a wonderful tradition of song. And a lot of the workers, while on the trains, would sing these songs, partly to kind of, um, to, to um, a lot of them were, were, were terrified of what was to come. They, didn't, they knew that there, there was this, this land of opportunity, Johannesburg, that was ahead of them. But they were afraid that they might, uh, uh, you know, they, they had no idea what it, would, what it was really going to be like until they got there. So they would sing these songs together to sort of... Uh, um, to comfort themselves in, in groups. And so I, I included those songs, um, which they absolutely, we know that they did sing on those train journeys inside the story itself. Well, b before uh, asking you the next question, I want to uh, let know to the audience that they can ask uh, their questions in the in the comment sections on Facebook and and, and in YouTube, and we can check it uh, here at the end of the of, of the session. Um, You were saying before about this kind of um, skepticism that exists in, 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 in academy regarding uh, comics and graphic histories. 
And I really think that, that, that these kind of works make a big contribution uh, to, to know better the past. You, you have told us a lot of examples of, of, of that. Uh, but how do you think? What do you think is your biggest contribution? In, in terms of in terms of contributing to uh, academic history or just, or or e historical education, both I think. Okay. Like, okay. Is it really, what do you think? Of what this is really relevant. We need to do this more work like that because mm -hmm. why? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I um, I sort of ended up working in this medium uh, not by accident, but more by kind of. Um, it's sort of an evolution of my appreciation of of history and how it is taught and how it is engaged with. Um, I think that certainly in my experience, when I was at high school in South Africa and then later at university, um, I feel that the curricula, um, I, I, I did study history at high school, but not at university. Um, was very dry. It covered important periods, but in a very uninspired, unimaginative way. So, for instance, I, there was a period of my high school career where I studied this very period, 1910 to 1948, but it was from the other side in the sense that it was about the elections and the political negotiations that were going on between the powerful parties. And there were some black and white photographs of these white statesmen. And there was lots of st statistics at a very sort of macro level about South African society. I had no idea. That the that the government bombed uh, white mine workers. That um, there were black women in Pretoria going out um, in in at night to be arrested um, to resist um, racist, sexist uh, laws, and so on and so on. And when I came across these court records in this dusty basement archive, I, I, my eyes were opened for the first time about the kind of history that I should have learned at high school. And I think the same applies to universities too. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that the knowledge that we are producing in the written form that is being studied at universities is worthless. I'm not saying that. I wouldn't, without, without uh, those sources, I would not have been able to create this book. What I am saying, though, is I think there should be created, uh, there should be more balance between the different mediums. I, th I think that they should even be produced in equal measure. I think that, that it's important to remember that PhDs and master's theses and um, academic journals, at the end of the day, are read by a very small insular community. And I think that's a problem. And I think that a lot of the knowledge inside those articles mm -hmm. uh, is not just for those people. It belongs to everyone. And it's important to everyone. It has meaning to everyone. And I think um, a child living in Kailicha in South Africa deserves to know about the history of that child's community and about the history of resistance, for instance, uh, not just in Kailicha, but all over South Africa, um, the heritage of that person. So um, I think there's a duty on um, historians and academic institutions to find new ways, imaginary, imaginative ways to, to repackage knowledge, make it accessible, make it engaging, and broaden the audience. And I am I'm seeing some really promising early evidence of the rise in this tendency around the world not so much in South Africa yet, but certainly in other countries. And um, I think part of, part of it has to do with this really old, unfortunate stigma that surrounds the graphics, let's call it comics medium. Even the word comic and the word graphic, they have many different uh, connotations, some of which are not very favorable. So people don't, as a result, take them seriously. People think, no, that's just for fantasy or that's just for children or that's not serious or whatever. But I really believe they can be. And they can be arguably even more powerful as a pedagogical or educational tool than words by themselves or even words and photographs together. So I'm a really I'm a firm believer in that. And I hope there are other people out there who hear what I'm saying or see these kinds of books and come to the same realization and do and, and, and tell stories um, in this in this way themselves. I completely agree with you. I, I, I... <laughs> I was. Uh, I really enjoy what you have you have said, uh, but in any case, it's really difficult to to do this. Like, um, 
And that's why I would like to know more about how was the process of, of the, the working process with the artist. Mm. Because sometimes it's difficult to, even if you are really compromised with this idea that you want to, to use different other media, uh, it's difficult to start uh, to create a project like this, how the connections of the, with, this art, with this artist were, were made, uh, what were the challenges. For example, in, in these cases, when you have to take some decisions, uh, historical decisions, that, uh, how was the, 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 who are the negotiations that you have to, to, to make with, with, with the, the big different artists because you were working with, with six different artists, am I right? That's right. Well, yeah, technically seven because because one chapter was done by brothers. But yes, yeah, six six different um, six different artists essentially for the six different chapters. Yeah, it's um, it was. I mean, first of all, creative people are not famous for being easy to work with. Uh, if, if if you'll excuse the stereotype, I mean, including writers. And if you've come from an academic academic background, you might also have a tendency to want to include as much written information. Uh, as possible. And I definitely came into this project with that tendency, which I sort of shared over time, thanks to the resistance from the artists, particularly the most experienced ones, who would say to me, Rich, you know, um, I don't really think that this text is necessary for the story, for the impact of the story on the reader. And in the beginning, I said, no, 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 it's just you don't understand it. Like, this is really important because, and I was kind of thinking, what happens if one of those academic historians is reading this book? I want him to be like, oh, wow, this writer really did his homework. But more and more, I realized, you know, I don't care if, if, that, if, that, if that person um, really, uh, they are not my ultimate audience. But I, but I can see the danger of falling into that trap of wanting to impress academia. Uh, at the end of the day, this is, I, I, would, I, I would be, I would be, I would, I would feel good. And, I, you know, I have felt good because academics have said to me, this is great. But their opinion is not the most important opinion. This is about the audience that, that doesn't currently feel welcome um, opening a book about history in a bookstore or in a library, okay, or in a classroom. So, um, sorry, just to go back to the artist, because that was your, what your question was about. I, first of all, I suppose it's worth me just saying something about the fact that I chose to work with six or seven artists rather than one, which is, which is, which is customary in, in the graphic novel, graphic history uh, world, that generally when the illustrator is not also the author, the author is a different person, then the author will usually pick one artist to work with and the end result is a collaboration between two people. For me, it started like that. I actually worked with the Trantral brothers on the, on the second chapter in the book. Um, first, because I'd previously worked with them on the other book I mentioned at the beginning of our, of, of our conversation. Um, and, but at the end of that, I, I, at the end of producing that chapter, I thought, you know, um, each one of these stories is about resistance, but they're about different people in different contexts and, um, very few, or you could argue none of them, um, are close enough to my identity as a white male South African for me to really connect with the, the story. I mean, obviously I can make educated guesses. And look, two of the stories are about white men. So you could argue that maybe I'm closer than the next person to those people. But I, I don't want to sort of over labor this point. But I do think that there's huge power in the broadness of collaborations. Because I think, I think to go into a project like that, you need to really instill confidence in your collaborator. And here there's a, there's a dynamic because I'm the one that did all the research, right? I'm the one that scripted it. But I, but I very quickly realized. Uh, that it was really important for me to, to, to get the message to the artist I was working with that their opinion is as important as mine about how the story is told. And actually for um, the story about uh, the widow of Marabastat that I spoke about earlier, the black woman who got arrested at night, um, I worked with a very brilliant South African artist called Dada Kanyisa. And Dada said to me, uh, when, when, when uh, Dada received the first script, uh, that the, ah, uh, thank you. That's great. There's now you got everyone. Dada, top left, said to me, um, I, I, think that we should, I think we should tell the story in a different way. And uh, a part of me was like, mm, I'm not sure, but I went with that as in instinct. And the story, I'm very glad to hear, Carla, that was one of your favorites and that you mentioned the child, because that was Dada's idea. 
I didn't come, I, I didn't write that story uh, initially um, as through um, a sort of two competing narratives or two parallel na narratives. That was entirely Dana's idea. And I think it strengthened the story. And uh, as a result, a lot more people have been able to connect with it. And I'm now quite used to people saying to me, that's my favorite story in the book. Um, so, but every, every, every artist, artist has a different personality. Some of them are, are very happy to be told what to do. But to the greatest extent possible, I tried to match the artist with a story that would inspire them. They felt a, a connection, connection with it. It could be a, a, like a heritage connection. In the case of the first chapter about the Indian passive resistance, Saeed Rakhbini is a, is a Muslim South African, and his family um, emigrated from, from India to, to South Africa sometime in the last 100 years. I don't remember exactly when. Okay, so, so there's, there's, that, there's that heritage of... of, of you know that, that that heritage of moving from India to come to come to South Africa and different things that I couldn't relate to directly that Saeed brought and he took ownership of the story, not, um, even though he didn't research it, he didn't discover it, and that was really wonderful because I think it broadened the the possibilities, the creative possibilities, and our ability to appeal to readers. I think those are really important things. So in the end, although along the way, I wasn't entirely sure about working with six different artists. Some people said to me, be careful because, you know, people are going to be paging to this book and they're going to find it frustrating that the artistic styles change with every chapter and they have to sort of reconnect with the medium every time. I had real doubts about it and I thought maybe I'd made the wrong decision. But now looking back, I'm really happy that I did it because I thought we, the stories had their own flavor. And for those people who visited South Africa, um, I like to think that, that the book itself is representative of South African society and it's kind of multicultural richness. Um, it's sort of surprisingly diverse to, to some people when they visit South Africa for the first time. And uh, that's what we try to, to mirror or represent um, through the different artists and through the different artistic styles that they brought. I think that's a very powerful, powerful idea because sometimes... Uh, um, as a historian, it's, it's very difficult to include as many voices as we can in our own narratives. And I think you were proof that uh, uh, this kind of, of media allows uh, to tell uh, histories in a more diverse way and including a lot of different uh, points of view and, and ideas and aesthetics. And I find that really, really exciting. We have some comments here. Uh, first, I'm going to put it in here. Yes, Sainab says, great work, great presentation. I had similar question. Uh, do you think illustrations are a good way to reach out to younger generations? But in the other hand, do you receive critics saying this is not real research? I hope not, because I also find it innovative as a legal historian. Uh, thanks very much for the question. Um, I, I absolutely think it's a it's a it's a medium that has the the power to connect with the younger generations more than perhaps media, mediums that we are media that we are uh, accustomed to just out, out of habit uh, and sort of the, the norms that have sort of set in in our uh, in, in the ways we learn and teach history unfortunate norms I would say outdated norms I would say. Um, but like, just going back to that sort of anecdote that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation where um, I was, you know, launching um, my earlier book in Kailicha, and I was actually with the Trontral brothers, the artists who contributed to both books. Uh, we were standing at the back of a, um, of, of a lecture hall and um, some, some school children, some high school children from the community had been invited to attend the launch. And we put a free copy of of um, the book on each seat. And uh, we were standing at the back just by chance and the children started filing into the room and they all sat down and they, they lifted the, the book up before they sat. And then they, you know, and they naturally started paging through. And we had this quite, this, this perfect sort of vantage point where we could see over their shoulders which pages they paused on. And all of them paused on the, on, on the illustrations, absolutely every one. And I think that really says something. Um, it, it has the power through its color and through, you know, the, the whole skill sets of the artist to kind of captivate the imagination, hold the attention, and hopefully um, enhance the memory of whatever is learned. Uh, I mean, I could, like I said, I could speak forever about this. I feel very strongly about it. And I think it's so unfortunate how limiting 
Um, and yet, at the same time, important. I must add that caveat. Words, or text only, can be. Um, so, so I feel like it's sort of I, I've sort of found this little niche where I'm sort of kind of the middle person in a way between this grand history of text only history and I'm sort of repackaging it. Very little of it is my own um, discovery uh, into a new form with a narrative and with characters to try and bring it to life for for a new audience. Um, and then, sorry, to answer the second part of the question, just about criticism. Fortunately, I haven't yet. But what I what along the way, in, in in the creation process, I made the effort to reach out to academics who were who who are uh, experts in the different areas of history that I was covering. Uh, and I would say about fifty percent of the time, I got a very favorable response, and they said, "No, please send me the draft of the of the graphic history. I would very happily read it." recommended some other um, sources that I hadn't come across yet and since checked certain ideas and also certain facts. But then on other, on other occasions, I really felt this strong air of condescension towards the medium. And I think that it's not just about uh, this medium is not serious. It's also uh, threatening to some academics because of what they're used to, because of this ivory tower of academia, which is very insular, where work is passed between peers, students and academics, but very little beyond. It kind of breaks down that silo, it breaks down those barriers. And I think that's threatening to people uh, who have staked their whole careers on, on, um, on, on being in academia. So I think that resistance, that stigma will be worn down by more work that gets created over inevitably in the years to come. And I really look forward to seeing new innovative ways of, of um, yeah, repackaging and reviving history using art. And we are working to make that possible. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we have another question here. It's Diona. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your work. I was wondering what patterns you might have seen working through the cases in terms of the way the court treated different groups and people. Uh, did anything new uh, or surprising to you came up where, about how the legal system seemed to work then? Oof, excellent question. Um, and, and actually, this is something that I normally mention. So thank you for the question, because I'd actually forgotten to mention it. Um, I didn't study uh, history and I didn't study law, um, which, I, which I think it could be argued as a disadvantage, but also possibly as an advantage, because I was coming from the, coming to these stories uh, without sort of a lot of legal baggage in my mind, you know, like and and sort of thinking too hard about the legal details and maybe about the historical. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but but I did come I come from a slightly external perspective in reading these court documents that were not I wasn't that comfortable with initially. And there were certain things about um, courts and certain things about the law and the legal systems, which I didn't know about and I learned along the way. And the, in, in All Rise, um, for those who get their hands on a copy of the book, um, they'll see there's two forewords. And one of them is by Justice Edwin Cameron, who's a very famous figure in South Africa. Uh, he was until recently when he retired um, a, a, ju a justice of the Constitutional Court in Johannesburg. And before that, he was actually a judge at the Supreme Court of Appeal, which was the appellate division where these stories came from. So he was a wonderful person, very generous in his time, and he read all the stories before they were published, and he gave me his feedback, and he also contributed a foreword. And he taught me something, because before being a judge in democratic South Africa, he was actually a lawyer during apartheid South Africa, often representing um, uh, dis people who were discriminated against by the government against the government. And therefore, he was operating, defending, defending the greater good um, in, a, in very difficult circumstances, right? Because I think we make this assumption often that 100% that of the time in a, in, in, a, in, a ra in a racist society where there's systemic racism, every, every power within it is 100% complicit and there's no chance of a victory for the other side within that system. Now, that is... I would say 99% of the time, the case. But Edwin Cameron showed me that even in the, 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 the infamous apartheid regime, it was possible for a black woman, say, or a black man uh, to win a court case in front of five or 11 white male judges. Now, you would ask, well, how is that possible? If 
they were going against the government, who were obviously uh, working closely with the courts towards like um, a, a, a greater goal. Um, and the answer is the law itself. These judges, um, and it's relevant to certain stories in All Rise, these judges didn't have a moment of, of sympathy or empathy for um, the discriminated against people involved. They instead, they, they had a very, very rigorous appreciation for the law. So that gave an opportunity to the lawyers to identify a tiny gap or a tiny loophole and convince uh, and, 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 and sort of use that, use that um, respect for the law that the judges all had almost against their instincts. And um, that is absolute, that it was absolutely the, the case in the first half of the 20th century and absolutely was the, the case of, during the apartheid era. Now, I'm not saying that um, there were many instances of this because it was extremely hard to find those tiny little gaps. Uh, but it is possible. And for a lot of uh, progressive lawyers and legal practitioners, it's extremely exciting to know that, there's, that, that this opportunity exists. And um, I tried to, to uh, you know, these stories don't all end happily, unfortunately, but some of them do. And um, I, in those ones, I tried to show, hopefully I succeeded, that um, there, even in the most difficult circumstances, opportunities can arise. For justice, of course. Um, in your in your um, first work, there was so oh, I can see some clothes working with social movements. When you were uh, talking, I was uh, thinking how social movements have uh, received your your work. This this particular this last work. Yeah, they're really my kind of allies and um, kind of partners in creating these books. Um, when I, and one of the major challenges I have in creating these books, which is relevant to people out there who are listening who might want to do the same themselves, is, um, of course, funding for the artwork. Um, I spend a lot of my time fundraising um, to pay the artists because, of course, they need to be paid and they need to be paid well for their very hard work because these, these stories are you know, between 20 and 35 pages long. And that's a huge amount of work. That's many months of, of, of you know, sketching and, 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 you know, ink work and then finally colors and edits and so on. And so I, um, for me, this is like, um, I sort of, I, I get huge, um, I don't know, emotional rewards out of, out of uh, working on these books. I don't fundraise for myself because that's just extra work on top of it. Um, mm -hmm. I have a day job that, that gets me by but I do this in my spare time out of passion, but I pay the artists. Now, um, the, the fundraising is a, is, a, is a big challenge. And um, I, Carla, I just suddenly lost my, my train of thought. You were asking about the, oh yes, the organization, sorry. And the, the organizations, um, when we published All Rise, one of the donors added extra money for us to print uh, 750 extra copies to be given to one of these civil society organizations to distribute amongst disadvantaged children around the country. And that was fantastic, particularly because that was really the aim of this book, not for it to end up in expensive bookstores or university libraries, for it to end up in communities, working class communities. And so that's the ongoing plan. And uh, I'm, currently, um, I'm currently fundraising for a, for a prequel volume of the book to dig even deeper into South Africa's resistance history to the 17, uh, 16, 17 and 1800s. And um, for that, I've partnered with two uh, prominent civil society organizations in South Africa. Um, and the idea is that even before it gets published to be bought by anyone around the world, it will be, the stories will be produced individually um, for distribution exclusively amongst um, uh, high school learners around the country who would never otherwise get their hands on, on, on these stories. So. I really hope I succeed, and um, yeah, that's my way of answering your question about the organizations. They've been incredibly supportive, and I see that, that they see, being progressive and open-minded, they see the value of creativity uh, and creative history um, in educating young people. Um, yeah, uh, I have some some interruptions, but I, I could hear it okay. completely. Right. Um, I was wondering if, if that is related 
uh, to your new project? The, you told the, me you have a new project and yeah so so yeah so so the so the i mean the fundraising will in you know it is it is being sort of supported by and endorsed by by two organizations but the 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 project i'm fundraising for is kind of as a direct result of uh the experience that i had creating this first book all rise and um Okay. And also, also from the from the from the from the success of it, because we've learned a lot of things. I want to make this bigger, better, um, with with some new artists, and dig even deeper into South Africa's past, to stories that are even harder to revive, uh, because we ha we don't have in photographs, for instance, in, you know, in in from the late 1800s backwards, and. Um, and yeah, th 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 that's that's the plan at, at this point, um, and I really hope that. Whether it's by me or, or or someone else, that in the end we have sort of other books, spin-offs of this project, because there's so many stories. Like I mentioned, you know, some of the, some of the court records in that in that basement archive are about, um, you know, you could think, oh, it's just a divorce case, but actually they're fascinating stories. They don't just tell you something about the couple getting divorced, but also about the climate of the country at the time. And and so I think there's endless possibilities out there for. For um, for court records and and similar archival documents to be used to um, bring to life stories that we would never ever know about otherwise. That sounds amazing. And when do you think? What, what is the? Uh, how long is this project going to take? I, I really need to to, to read that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I mean, so I, I oh, I wish I wish I could say one year. It it really depends on fundraising because uh, the moment the moment I can pay the artist, I can I can get to work. Um, but uh, yeah, so to give you an idea, I mean, there there are there are early trial records um, related to slaves, runaway slaves, uh, and other resistors uh, who were living in Cape Town in the 1600s and 1700s, and uh, and. They're all in high Dutch, so I need, I, I, which I don't speak, so I, I need to get that, those translated. But they are the kind of raw ingredients of some wonderful stories and um, very visual stories. And they will also introduce new challenges with with the, you know, the the boundaries between what we factually know and what we can reliably create through creativity and and, and you know filling the gaps with with the artwork. So yeah. Um, uh, with any like in, in, in let's just say in, in the next two years it'll be near to fruition well i'll be waiting in <laughs> <two years. laughs> well, we are reaching the end of the of this 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 talk and i would like to close with one question i always ask to my to our guest and it's one piece of advice of to those uh, who want to develop this kind of projects where will be your your best advice for those who are starting to thinking into thinking uh, making uh, a graphic history um i would say um i would say don't listen to anyone who tells you that the medium is not serious that it doesn't have immense power and if anyone ever does tell you that it's probably because they feel threatened by it in some way and if you and if you aren't convinced by my by that statement I would suggest uh, just giving the medium a chance through some of the wonderful, wonderful books that are being created right now around the world. Uh, I'm constantly treasure hunting when I go to a new country for the best graphic works out there. Brazil, Spain, or Norway, countries are producing, there are, there are creators there creating magnificent books um, using the graphic medium uh, in all sorts of innovative ways. And I, uh, I really, really recommend them um, even before my own book. So, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully th th that's enough to, to convince people that are sort of on the verge of trying this themselves if, if they have any lingering doubts. I'm sure they are going to be really convinced. <laughs> uh, well, we have reached to the end of this conversation. Richard, thank you again for joining us today. And to our audience, please meet our next broadcast. And see you soon. Thank you, Carla.